Uh, this is uh, David Hovde. I am uh, here at the Indiana Veterans Home with Raymond Miller, and, and uh, also in the room is uh, Christine Turpin. And it is uh, December 12th, uh, 2014, and we are here to interview uh, Mr. Miller ab about his, uh, his life, uh, which includes uh, a time at Purdue University. So, uh, Mr. Miller, you may uh, begin if you could talk to us about your, uh, you know, when, where and when you were born and, and, your, uh, and your early life. Well, my name is uh, Raymond Miller, usually referred to as Ray. And I was born in uh, Mount Vernon, Ohio, uh, October 3rd, 1922. And uh, <clears throat> spent the uh, first five years of my life uh, living in Mount Vernon. And uh, my family <clears throat> decided to move to Marion, Indiana due to some family situations. Uh, uh, the uh, at the time, there was not much uh, work available, so my father moved the family out to Marion, Indiana. And my mother had a father who was, uh, uh, did uh, uh, contracting work. He, be, he made sidewalks and raised houses and, and put foundations under them and dug basements. So he provided employment for a good part of the family, uh, my mother, my, my grandfather, my mother's father, uh, provided employment for about five male relatives uh, that he used in his uh, construction crew. So we were fortunate that we had uh, uh, employment for a good many members of the family. And we were fortunate that my granddad knew how to do those things, uh, as I say, dig basements and raise houses and put foundations under them and pour cement sidewalks and, and build uh, rock walls and arches and dig basements. And it just goes on that, that he had employment for, uh, he, in fact, at the times were really uh, uh, for one of a better word, were, were tough. It was hard to to uh, uh, find employment, so he provided uh, sustenance and uh, employment for about five families. In fact, during that time when we arrived in Marion, we didn't have any place to go, so my grandfather took us in with others. At one time, there were five families living in his home with the man providing employment. Uh, that was in uh, 1927. 27 was the, the time when we had uh, the, uh, the onset of a Great Depression. As we all know, the stock market failed in 1929 and there was a crash and people didn't ha that had money in the banks suddenly lost all their money and it, it was a giant depression. It's been termed as the Great Depression. And many, fa many families were forced to live together and help each other. So we were very fortunate that we had uh, employment and had uh, uh, shelter. We had food and, and, uh, and my father had work. Uh, I, I hesitate, or no, I intersperse this by saying my father was rather nomadic. He sometimes wasn't satisfied with where he was, so we moved many times. That was my childhood uh, experience. Uh, but uh, he was a good provider, and uh, so we didn't have any problem there. So that was in uh, 1927, we moved to uh, Marion, Indiana, where I grew up uh, with my, uh, my family, my two brothers and I, and my mother and father, and uh, uh, my maternal grandparents were there with their families. And uh, 
there I uh, was five years old at the time and I entered into school a little early. We had a school about a mile and a half away uh, in Marion, Indiana. It was out on Salem Pike. So we didn't have buses or transportation. So we walked to and from school every day. And uh, fortunately, I entered school at the age of five and uh, entered into a country school. And uh, so we, we uh, walked to and from school winter and summer. And so we had it, we had a good time. My brothers weren't quite school age, they were younger. I was the oldest son um, and I had uh, two brothers. Our family consisted of five, of course, and uh, the two brothers and I, uh, we, uh, for, for my memory, we were happy to be in this little town of Marion, Indiana as we moved from Mount Vernon, Ohio. Uh, school was was interesting. I remember we learned to sing America and we uh, I got to clean the, the erasers for the teacher after school. Oh that was quite an honor uh, to clean to help the teacher and she I was happy to be selected as her helper and uh, so we would traverse that area and uh, and we had uh, nicknames for the various locations that we passed by. Uh, we had, uh, we lived out on the north side of Marion, Indiana, and we walked uh, over to the east side to our country school. And we passed by a place we called Possum Hollow. <laughs> and that's where the people did really raise hogs and uh, 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 and later on, we as boys found employment by mow mowing lawns and uh, and uh, feeding the hogs down in Possum Hollow. <laughs> and and uh, so we had a, along with uh, beginning our education, we had a good time uh, with uh, family affairs. Being a huge family with that many there, we uh, we had a good uh, relationship with everyone. It, it was a nice, friendly relationship, and uh, we uh, were almost uh, old enough to help with the construction. To some extent, uh, my uh, we would screen the uh, uh, gravel to get the sand to pour sidewalks and things like that. So we had a good time growing up, and. Uh, uh, that uh, comprised uh, mostly growing up in uh, Indiana. As we grew older, my father uh, finally managed to get a home, and uh, we moved into our home, and uh, during that time I became interested in uh, baseball. I, w I was a, a developed into a pretty good baseball player. And that was the most of my activity was, uh, well, and I, I preface that by saying the activity in the home, we didn't have a basement. And my two brothers and I, during our spare time, dug the basement uh, for our home. And uh, my father put in a, from a, hot bellied stove in the uh, upper, he put in a furnace, and so we boys were, were uh, we did a lot of help in digging the basement and maintaining the home there. And uh, so we, we had a good time, and uh, then I entered the school from, uh, from a country school into, the, into Marion Town in the north side of town where we went to a primary school there, and we uh, entered into church activities, and uh, so we we lived uh, what you might call a fairly normal life. Uh, I remember uh, 
across the street lived a, a World War I veteran, and we were so interested in, uh, in uh, his uh, adventures overseas, and uh, so we pestered him a lot uh, as boys asking about his, uh, his experiences. And I know I'm jumping ahead a little bit, but during that time uh, I became interested in baseball. And uh, in, in growing up, we uh, went out to the, what we called the Soldier's Home in Marion, Indiana. It was the Veterans Administration, World War I veterans. And uh, I became a player on uh, what they called the American Legion <coughs> team. And we would go out to the uh, VA and play baseball to entertain the World War I veterans. So that's how we became acquainted. And we developed into a pretty nice team that made quite a reputation and traveled all over the uh, part of central Indiana playing other teams. And uh, I know I'm uh, going ahead a little bit, but this interest developed into uh, 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 acquaintance with a man in uh, Marion who was a waymaster, and he was an alumni of uh, Purdue. His name was Harvey Klein, and so he, without we knowing, he went ahead uh, to go to uh, Purdue and mention my name to Dutch Faring, uh, who was the baseball coach. So that's how I became acquainted with uh, the Purdue uh, through my baseball adventures. And uh, we had another man, uh, Tony Hinkle, who was a uh, baseball coach at Butler University. And he came and uh, helped coach us and he was interested. And we had sponsors there, the fire department people sponsored our team and t took us on trips to and from various uh, uh, places in Indiana. I'm getting a little bit ahead, but uh, we had uh, some rivalry with Anderson, Indiana, and they had a track star there by the name of Johnny Wilson. And our team played uh, uh, Anderson team, and uh, Johnny Wilson was well noted for his speed. He ran a 100-yard dash in record time. And I was a catcher, and uh, during the time, the, during the game, he would, got on base and he tried to steal. And uh, uh, fortunately, I threw him out at second base on his, uh, twice during the game, <laughs> so I was proud of that. But Harvey, uh, he more or less was a scout for, for uh, Purdue, and so he mentioned my name to Dutch Faring. And uh, this is a little bit ahead of our schedule, but that's how I became acquainted with uh, coming to Purdue to play baseball. And so uh, uh, I developed a, a, a kind of a reputation for being a baseball player and, uh, uh, and, I, and I, I played golf. Uh, I wasn't much of an athlete, I was small. I, I was, Weighed, didn't weigh over 150 pounds, so I didn't play football. And my father was interested in me ha having a career in baseball, so he wouldn't let me play football anyway. <laughs> and uh, so uh, I hope I'm describing the growing up process of living as a boy in Marion, Indiana, and interested in baseball and helping my grandfather in his uh, contracting work. And he put us to work, like I say, digging basements and uh, screening gravel for his sand to, to make so sidewalks and so on. So, and we always had a big family entertainment uh, gathering. Uh, we have pictures here of large families that were prominent in those days where people gathered together and. Uh, this is kind of an aside, but uh, food was a little bit scarce, and uh, we, my grandfather lived on a small seven-acre plot, 
in uh, North Marion, Indiana, and he had uh, hogs, and he had a cow for milk, and he had chickens, and he had fruit trees, and uh, he would help. We would help in the garden, and in, in the summertime and the harvest time, we would take food into Marion and sell it for whatever we could sell. This is an aside, but I didn't have shoes, and uh, we went into town to sell the vegetables from the garden. And I knew the, some of the, the, the students, that, and I knocked on one door, and a little girl came to the door, and she looked, oh, she started like, oh, he doesn't have shoes. I was mortified, think, thinking, uh, here I was trying to help my granddad sell these vegetables, and uh, she, she made the comment about, <laughs> I didn't have shoes to wear. We didn't have shoes to wear in the summertime, but long about fall, uh, my mother would take us and we'd buy shoes they used to call elk skins. Uh, they were uh, a high, high top shoe and they were like today's work shoes. And that, that was the, shoe, the uh, shoes we had to wear and we wore short pants, knickers we called them. And it was, it was a it was a treat to be able to go to long pants. That was something we were proud of when we were allowed to wear long pants, long trousers. And uh, so uh, I hope I'm not rambling too much. Uh, so we uh, basically uh, going out to, to play baseball at the, at the Veterans Administration and getting acquainted with those World War I veterans and playing to entertain them and also it helped uh, further my so-called baseball career to uh, and, uh, and uh, the fire department people who sponsored us took it, taking us on trips to play teams from various towns in Indiana. So basically we had a good time. When I got into high school, uh, I got on the golf team and my father wouldn't let me play football. So, but I did be, develop into being a pretty fair golfer, uh, and uh, so that was a sport that I liked to, to indulge in. And uh, so we grew up, and I, uh, with that background in mind, I went. To, uh, I graduated from uh, Marion High School in 1940, and. Uh, we had a small college in, in Marion called Marion College. And at the time, it had uh, one administration building and one dormitory uh, and, uh, and a chapel. And they had about 100 students. So uh, after graduating uh, in the spring of 1940 from Marion High School in the fall, I enrolled in Marion College, and there I spent a year, the first year in Marion College, where uh, I uh, had a math teacher whom I admired so much, and a science teacher who conducted an experiment the first time I ever stayed up all night long to conduct an experiment. I had never spent overnight time <laughs> until I went to Marion College. Well, be that as it may, I uh, spent my first year in Marion College, and uh, then uh, during the summer we stayed in Marion, and in the fall, uh, let's see, that would be 1940, uh, and, and uh, with, uh, with a year in Marion College, we got into the year 1941. And during the summer, uh, with the help of Harvey Klein, a so-called scout for Dutch Faring, Harvey Klein uh, uh, was helpful in getting me to come to Purdue uh, to enroll in, the, in, the, in 1941, the fall of 41. And uh, so uh, Dutch Faring, I met him, and of all things, he gave me a job in the locker room, sweeping the locker room, and for that, I got my meals at the, at the, at the uh, student union. 
got my meals free. Well, my brother and I uh, enrolled in uh, Purdue in uh, the fall of 1941. And uh, during that time, uh, the, if I remember, the student body was something around 3,000 people. And uh, we enrolled in, uh, at the uh, armory and we were overwhelmed. We thought we would never be able to manage this coming from a little town in Marion. And uh, so we enrolled uh, in uh, the fall of 1941 and we found a rooming house, my brother and I, and a dear old lady who had an upstairs apartment with bunk beds. And my brother and I and another friend from Marion, uh, we roomed in the that rooming house about a block off campus. So during that time, I bought an old Model A Ford to travel back and forth to, to Purdue, and we went across State Road 26 time after time. And uh, so I'd park the car in, uh, in Lafayette, West Lafayette, and then in the weekend, we'd drive back home. Uh, uh, the point being that uh, uh, during that time in the in the fall, we would go back home every, every weekend to Marion, and on a Sunday afternoon, December seventh, nineteen forty-one, uh, I was down at the Marion Armory in the afternoon playing basketball without so a, car, a care in the world. I did. Way the world was falling apart, and and uh, like most teenagers at that time, it, we weren't concerned about it. We didn't know much about it. The, the news wasn't too uh, too prevalent at that time. Uh, so uh, after an afternoon of uh, basketball, I came home in the evening, and there my family was there to greet me, and they said we've been attacked. Pearl Harbor's been attacked, and that was the evening. And uh, so my father, he was in his 40s, and he assumed at that time that he might be able to serve, but, but he had uh, three sons who were at, age, uh, at the age where we could serve. So we were overwhelmed with that news, and his reaction, and God bless him, was still protective. He said, I'm going to take you boys down to the Everglades and hide out. And so we said, oh no, Father, that wouldn't do for us. So uh, Russell and I, my brother who enrolled, went back to Lafayette. And uh, my memory tells me that the next day we walked across the Wabash to the, 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 the uh, uh, recruiting station and uh, we wanted to enlist into the Army. Uh, we wanted the Army Air Corps, but it was called Enlisted Reserve, and they didn't take us in, uh, uh, immediate call us in, so we w continued our education at uh, Purdue uh, for in the, in the fall of 41, and they called us into service in the spring of 1942. So uh, during that time, I thought I wanted to be a civil engineer, and I uh, majored in math and science uh, during that time. And uh, so that was the bulk of my education one year in uh, Marion College and the fall semester into spring in Purdue. And uh, at that time, in the spring of 42, we were called into service, and we got to do what we wanted to do. And I have to say uh, this is something I had nothing to do with, but to, to be a flyer, which we wanted to be, you had to have certain qualifications, attributes. Uh, you had to have keen eyesight, almost perfect eyesight. You had to have coordination. You had to have depth perception. 
you had to have the ability to withstand all kind of movements without getting air sick. And the good Lord provided those attributes so we were able to enter into the uh, uh, process of learning to be uh, uh, flyers for the uh, Army Air Corps. Now that's what we were in. And uh, so uh, that was uh, something that we were fortunate that we had uh, enough education, uh, prior education to meet the requirements uh, to be, uh, to get into the Army Air Corps. And that's where we enlisted in, or we were called to serve in. And uh, so that was in the spring of uh, 40, 1942. Uh, we went, uh, if you if you like, I'll go in with our military experience. Yeah, well, the ROTC. Uh, oh, what? ROTC. Thank you for yeah. reminding me. Uh, in that, uh, in the fall, we uh, when we enlisted or enrolled in Purdue, we went into the ROTC, and we being a block off campus, I was able to put the uniform on and walk to the armory where we enlisted. At that time, uh, mostly co close order drill and some military information. So we spent, I think it was two days a week in the, in the ROTC in, uh, in their uh, activities. And, uh, and that of course was uh, the time when uh, we had declared war in 1941. In the in the in the wait no wait a minute 40, 41. yes well that was when I was in school in Purdue and that that's when the uh, Pearl Harbor was attacked and ROTC apparently changed their regiment knowing that we'd be uh, uh, called into service the ROTC people. And so I was able to go to ROTC for a short time before being called, and before I called up. And the baseball, uh, I was to play baseball in the spring for Dutch Faring, and uh, I never got to play uh, baseball because we were called into service. Uh, I, I went to, uh, uh, if you don't mind, after coming back all these years, after all these years, I was able to come back to Purdue and go out to their game in the fall and be able to throw out the first pitch. Uh, and I met the, the Mr. Alexander and, and the baseball coach and all the team players. So I was honored to, to be back at Purdue. What and year was that? That would be 2000. Chris, help me. That that'd be 2012. 2013. 2013. Oh, okay. After all those years, 67 year years. That. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so that uh, I am I'm saying that I didn't have that much experience in ROTC except that we we're uh, a couple days a week. I walked about a block to in my uniform and was able to go to the armory and participate in their exercises. And during that time, we had a meeting uh, at, uh, uh, I forget, Music Hall? Uh, the president gave us talk about uh, the situation that we were undergoing in, in the world and I remember one phrase he used. He said, we are now skating on the thin ice of this pond. And I, that stuck with me all these years. Uh, but they obviously were aware of the world situation and what was happening in Europe and in, in uh, Asia. And uh, so their, their, I'm sure their activities were d developing the ROTC and we never got to participate because in the spring we were called into service. So uh, uh, if you like, I'll go on to, and uh, c 
kind of describe our okay. military. Yeah, in just a second. Yes. I'm going to take a quick break here yes. and just make sure everything's all fine all right. with the recorder. You can collect your thoughts. All right. I, okay. yes. You can talk about, and don't forget to talk about your baseball experiences in the Army Air, Air Corps, too. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yes. Uh, okay, that, we're ready again. All right. That, yes, that's good. Uh, I, I thank you for that. Yes, uh, we, uh, it, what uh, prompted us to want to fly, I go back in history, in the early part of the aviation, uh, they had uh, people who would come to towns and barnstorm with their airplanes and offer rides. And uh, uh, I remember a barnstormer came out to, to our town and it was a, a little two-wing biplane and it, and it didn't have a tailwheel, it had a piece of wire for the tailwheel, and he offered us rides for a dollar, of all things. That was big money in those days. So we became interested in flying, my brother and I. Well, my, my two brothers, we all en ended up in the Army Air Corps. And uh, so <clears throat> that was, uh, that was help pump our de de decision to try to join the Army Air Corps. And uh, let's see, uh, my, my, my parents' reaction to all this, I think I've covered, was that they, they thought they wanted to protect us. And, and that, that at the time it ended up they had three boys in the service during the war which was, a, and I'll get to that about the sacrifices that they and our country made during that time. So, uh, so anyway, that prompted us to uh, uh, try to be uh, uh, aviators in the, uh, in the uh, service of our country. So uh, my brother and I, uh, one uh, February morning, uh, hopped on the train and went down to Camp Atterbury and uh, we had our civilian clothes and they sent us on to Fort Thomas, Kentucky. And we got down there in the evening and our clothes were filled with soot and smoke uh, from the, they had, uh, the trains didn't have a compartment, didn't have a, uh, cars that were weatherproof, you know. So anyway, we got there and uh, the uh, mess hall was empty, but they had some spinach <laughs> left over. We never ate spinach in our life until that evening. <laughs> that we, 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 uh, we were hungry, we ate spinach. Well, to make our story shorter, we went from Fort Thomas down to Biloxi, Mississippi. Uh, and the Keesler Field was called. And we did our basic training there where we learned the drilling and we learned how to uh, follow orders and so on. And then we, after that, uh, there was a happening there. Uh, I have to mention this. At Keesler Field, we had a review. And who should come to our field but Anthony Eden and General Marshall. Anthony Eden was the premier uh, minister of England, so we had a review. So we it was it was hot in the spring, and, and we we had the people who uh, kind of bobbed along. And uh, you sometimes sometimes you can be cruel. Well, this man was ruining our review. We thought when we stood out there for a couple hours in the heat, he finally healed over from the heat. So I have to admit, I, I, we knew it, it wasn't uh, uh, serious, but they took him out of the formation. And of all things, we were happy because we were going to have a fine review for, <laughs> for the dignitaries who were coming. <laughs> but uh, that's a kind of a sidelight. But anyway, we went from uh, Keesler Field where we did our basic training and went to uh, San Antonio, Texas, where we learned uh, the rudiments. We learned, uh, uh, we had uh, 
physical training. We had uh, Morse code. We had engine maintenance. We had all the all the things that we might need in the future there as, as uh, ground school. And uh, among the among the schooling was uh, physical training. And I have to add this: we had physical training instructors. And being a baseball player, some of some of the folks might remember uh, Enos Slaughter and Del Wilbur. They were Hall of Famers in the major leagues, and they were our instructors in uh, in physical training. And about all things, I got to play baseball with Enos Slaughter and Del Wilbur. That was a lot of fun. We had to run five miles every morning, and. Uh, uh, and then, then we had our ground school in the afternoon. So we spent some time there, and lo and behold, that wasn't quite enough according to our uh, leadership, which I admired very much. So we went to St. Louis, Missouri in what they call a college training detachment. And uh, there we learned all the fine points of dead reckoning, navigation, meteorology, and all the things it would take for us to be, uh, uh, be uh, have the aptitude to be able to do our job as, as we were being trained for. So we spent some time in, uh, in uh, Jefferson College in St. Louis, and there we, uh, our first introduction into flying they had a little Piper Cub out at Lambert, Lambert Field, and they took, we spent 10 hours flying in a Piper Cub as passengers. After that stint was over, then we went uh, to uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma, into primary training. My brother was with me all this time, and there we learned to fly a little low-wing airplane called a PT-19, and uh, it was an open cockpit, and uh, uh, it, it had the basic, it had uh, the controls, uh, had, and uh, we didn't have landing lights or anything of that nature, and we learned contact flying. and. Uh, my brother and I, we made some 150 landings. I have to intersperse that. Uh, we had uh, civilian instructors, uh, and they were in their mid-40s or 50s, but they had thousands of hours of flying. They were expert flyers. It couldn't be better f for it to have them as our teachers. And uh, during my time, after six hours of uh, dual flying, we landed one time, the, the instructor hopped out of the airplane. He said, now it's all yours, six hours. And uh, he said, you take this around three times and land around the landing pattern. Oh my, I was frightened. I had dual instructors where he taught us to do uh, aerial acrobatics, among which was, uh, I, I get a little head, the falling leaf where you side slipped. And the reason for that, we had uh, 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 fields that were not at our main field at, at, uh, at Tulsa. They were uh, little, uh, little fields that we used uh, to uh, practice our landings and they had uh, were surrounded with foliage and wiring and so on. So we had to learn to side slip in and then, then make our approach. Well, this instructor taught us to do the falling leaf among the, all the other acrobatics that we had to do so we could learn to side slip in, lose altitude, and then come into this little, uh, 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 little landing field that we practiced on. So uh, anyway, I was able to get to my solo flight after six hours, and uh, and the bulk of our training was uh, contact flying, CFR they called it, where we learned to do some cross country and we learned to do acrobatics, and uh, this is diver divergent, but 
I have to tell you quickly that two or three acrobatics we learned to do were a slow roll, a snap roll, and a spin. And, a, and a, to, just to, to, to tell you briefly, on a slow roll was the most difficult thing we had to do. Uh, we had an airplane that, that uh, had 120 horsepower. It didn't have a great deal of power. And so to do a slow roll, we had to descend and build up speed. And then you had to turn on your side. And the nose always wanted to drop. So you had to use top rudder to keep your nose up. And then when you got over on your back, you had to do the reverse. You had to push the control stick forward and hold your nose up. Uh, and uh, then as you ran, uh, uh, as you rolled over on the other side, you still had to use top rudder. And then when you leveled out, you had to use the reverse on your control stick uh, to hold to maintain all that speed to do a slow roll. And a and a snap roll was an easy maneuver of all things. You'd think it'd be difficult, but a snap roll, you just did a horizontal spin, uh, and you used uh, opposite controls to throw you into a, uh, you had to remember to, in your head to use opposite controls to do that quick snap roll and back into it too. And so it was not a difficult maneuver. Well, I'm getting a little bit ahead, but anyway, we learned uh, cross country. We learned acrobatics. We learned. Uh, uh, we didn't learn uh, some of the uh, attributes that we learned later on. So we spent uh, roughly about a hundred, hundred and fifty land landings, and we did contact flying. And during that time, I got lost on a cross. -country. I thought my career was over, and I have to I have to say this. Uh, I didn't have the uh, the sense, so to speak, to go fly down and look at a railway station and see if I could identify where where I was. So I looked out and I saw glints in the sky, and I flew toward the. Sure enough, they were airliners. So I followed them into the Tulsa airport. <laughs> and I landed there and I called the instructor and I said, I got lost. I'm down at the Tulsa airport. <laughs> he flew over. He said, you fly back with me, uh, formation with me back. I thought, oh, oh, this is it. I won't be able to. And he didn't wash me out. Uh, I can, I, so I was lucky. That, you might call that one miracle. <laughs> and uh, so my brother was with me, and bless him. Uh, he, was, he was learning to fly also, but he washed out. He, he didn't have any sense of direction. And they said, you'd make a fine Sunday afternoon pilot, but we can't use you because you, you don't have that sense that pilots need. So right quickly after a series of cross countries and acrobatics in that uh, little PT-19 Fairchild, 120 horse, then we graduated and we went into what they called basic training. And there we learned to fly a VT-13, commonly called the Roll-T Vibrator. And there it, it had a uh, enclosed cockpit, it had uh, variable pitch propeller, it had landing lights, and it had a big 450 horse engine, and there we learned to do night flying, and we learned to do instrument flying. We'd cover up the cockpit, and we, we, we learned how to fly through the clouds, and we learned how to make night landings, and uh, without well, we had landing lights, and sometimes we'd shut them off and go along on the runway light. But we learned all those facilities in basic training, and there we made some, something like uh, 100, 120 landings day and night. And about half our uh, uh, 
flights were uh, dual and half were single. You flew alone a lot and solo a lot. Very quickly after that, that was at uh, Coffeyville, Kansas. And uh, uh, that, that, uh, then we were sent to uh, what we called advanced training. And here's a, uh, to go with a, a question, what, what prompted you to go into bombers? Well, it didn't, I didn't have much to do with that because uh, they had a kind of a rule there that if you weighed over 175 pounds and you had a reasonable amount of strength, they put you in the heavy bombers because you were too big to get into the cockpit of a fighter. <laughs> so so uh, I inadvertently, I ended up going into four engine training later on because I was a, a little larger than, uh, than the requirements were. And uh, so, uh, collect my thoughts here. Uh, Pampa, Texas was a uh, Twin engine advanced flying school, and there we flew in what we called an AT 17, sometimes called the bamboo bomber. Uh, and there we learned to do uh, rendezvous flying with our instructor, we learned to do cross country, we learned to do night flying, we learned to do instrument flying, not only the link trainer, but uh, instrument flying. Uh, uh, and we learned to fly the beam, fly the radio navigation in those days. Uh, they had uh, beacons 10 miles apart where you, if you had visual you could fly down the line of beacons and, and, and if it wasn't visual you had a radio station, uh, ranges, radio ranges that transmitted signals, A and N signals, and when they merged they made a beam. So we learned how to fly, go do our instrument flying on the beam and knowing how to come to a, to a station. So we learned all that. And uh, there I had another uh, instance of, we had a rendezvous flight with an instructor and we didn't, we didn't have any uh, relation, uh, any uh, relationship to the ground. It all had to be done by uh, uh, dead reckoning, or well, we were supposed to rendezvous with the instructor. And uh, I, I was a command pilot that day, and we, the, 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 my co-pilot decided we were a little bit ahead of time, and he lowered the flaps, and we were up in, in altitude, and uh, oh, oh, the flaps wouldn't come up. And so I was faced with a decision. What do I do? I did the only thing I knew to do was search for a field, uh, a nice country field and made a forced landing. And I sent my co-pilot to call the instructor. And uh, we waited there. He came with a, a mechanic and they got the flaps up. And he looked at me again said, you fly formation with me back to the base. And, I, and again, I thought, this is the end of my flying career. And so when we got back, he dismissed me, and I thought he winked at me. I'm not sure, but he said, go on back to your barracks. And he didn't watch me out. So there is another, we might call it a miracle, that I got to stay in, and I went on to uh, four engine training. And uh, well, there I learned to fly, uh, at that time, B-17 was a heavy bomber and four engine training. And I went through uh, 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 training at Ardmore, Oklahoma, a uh, sidelight. Gene Autry had a lake there, and he donated his lake to us so we could uh, 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 simulate uh, ditching in the water so we would know how to do if we had to ditch later on. 
so he donated his lake there and uh, and during that time I played on the, the base uh, the softball team sponsored by our base and you know we won the, the whole south western con uh, area of the country we were the champions and we were to go to Cleveland, Ohio for the national finals. Well, during that time, uh, my, uh, I was, I'll preface that, because we were faced with a decision that we had to make, do you want to take another four months of four engine training or do you want to go overseas as a co-pilot? And uh, I don't know what made me do this, but I said, I want to go overseas. Well, that decision resulted in the Red Cross getting my two brothers and I to go to uh, back home again before I went overseas. And uh, so I had to forego the national finals in the, in the uh, softball tournament. So uh, I, Going that was uh, that was in uh, 1944, uh, the fall of 44. Thank you, and uh, uh, that that's when I made the decision to go overseas. Now I have to preface it by going a little bit ahead of time, and I look back how fortunate that decision was, because uh, Christmas. Eve day, 1944, our men and women were surrounded at Pestone in the Battle of the Bulge, and our base took a maximum effort. In fact, the whole Army Air Corps, Eighth Air Force, took a, a maximum effort. And that day, we had 2,000 heavies in the air, as opposed to normally 1,000 on a normal day. And we had uh, 900 fighter support, and we had uh, uh, any number of medium bombers who did uh, do diversion rates to draw the fighters away from us. But the end result is that the targets we hit resulted in the men who were trapped without food, without ammunition, were freed from that battle. And I, in retrospect, I think, what if I had decided to take another four months of four engine? I wouldn't have been effective at all in that uh, Battle of the Bulge, and I wouldn't have been anything more than a four engine pilot for what reason. I'd. So anyway, uh, to, to, to make the story shorter, the Red Cross arranged for the three brothers to come home and visit uh, on the leave before I went overseas. And uh, I, so I had my two brothers and I, we all got home before that happened. And uh, so to go on, uh, at the end of our four engine training in Ardmore, we went up to Lincoln, Nebraska with our crew. We, uh, we with our, the crew was picked and uh, we were assigned an airplane, and here we were, young young fellows, and they said, this is your airplane. At that time, it was worth about $350,000, and they said, this is your airplane and your crew, and you fly from Lincoln, Nebraska to Valley, Wales, in England. Here we were, most of us hadn't been out of the county even before, and here we were to fly an airplane across the, uh, the country and across the ocean <laughs> into a foreign country. Well, we made it, I'll be very brief, but we, we flew across the country to uh, uh, New Hampshire, refueled, and went on to Goose Bay, refueled, and uh, uh, we had to put tents under our engines and heaters to keep uh, everything from freezing. So we flew on across Greenland, well, up over the mountains, and uh, landed in Iceland, refueled again, and then on to Valley Wales, where we were greeted 
with German propaganda. And this, this is true, and I wouldn't say it wasn't. We know your name. We know your number. We, th this was on the, on the German propaganda radio. And they said, we just want to warn you what goes up must come down. So they greeted us. <laughs> that was our greeting. And, and the people that greeted us said, well, your average life here is 12 nations. That, uh, that was the average. Uh, I di divert a little bit by saying our base uh, had 66 B-17s. And it was, uh, it came in, uh, in 1944, in the spring of 44, as, a, as an ad addition to the Air Force. And uh, during that time, 44 to 45, they flew 250 missions altogether, and they lost 110 B-17s. And uh, so our average life was 12 missions. And uh, so another miracle, uh, miracle of miracles, we made it. And the other miracle was the maximum effort where 2,000 heavies were able to fly over Germany. and. Uh, that was, uh, our, our missions ended in March of 1945. Our last mission was to Berlin. Now, I, 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 I know there were a, a couple missions that I want to digress a little bit. One was, it was, it was the uh, practice for new flyers to fly two missions with a experienced crew. It, it otherwise, well, it saved my life. Anyway, you wouldn't, in emergencies, you might not know what to do if you were sent out alone. So uh, I flew two missions with an experienced crew. And uh, the first one was what they called a milk run. We went to Neunkirchen, Germany, and we saw some flak and no fighters. And uh, so my first mission was, uh, was uh, what they called a milk run. The second mission, I flew again with an experienced crew, and our, our target was Ludwigshafen, Mannheim, Twin Cities on the Rhine River, and uh, we were to hit some rail yards there. And uh, I uh, was a co-pilot, and we climbed at about 100 feet a minute, had full fuel load, full ammunition, and bomb load. And I looked at, at my part, looked at the fuel gauge, and it was over half gone. And we hadn't even arrived at our merging point at 15,000 feet that day. And I asked the pilot, we, we're, we're low on fuel, are we gonna make it? He said, yes, we'll make it. Well, anyway, we merged at, at our merging point and then climbed the rest of the way. And uh, then we turned on our, we, uh, we separated into squadrons and went over the target, a squadron at a time. And uh, so we went down about a 40 mile bomb run and I could see all the smoke and all the, all the uh, flak and uh, all the flashes. And, and I asked the pilot, is that flak? And he said, yes. Well, I'm gonna be very brief here, but the next thing I saw, uh, we were at the target, and the flash, uh, I saw the flash, and in came some fragments in our front window and hit me, and uh, knocked me back, about like a giant taking a baseball bat and striking it, and it cut my oxygen, and uh, so I was coming unconscious, and the uh, the top turret gunner, the crew chief, took his mask, he saw what happened, put his mask on my face, and then he searched for a walk-around oxygen bottle and came back and hauled me out of the seat. And the pilot had some sh uh, shred shards of gl glass in his eyes. And so this man uh, took me out of the seat and climbed in and uh, there he, had to leave formation and we went down on the deck to, to, get, to get away from enemy radar. Uh, we got back 
and uh, search for a hospital to take care of me. And uh, so that was my introduction into combat. <laughs> and I was so fortunate to have an experienced crew and this man who did this, he should have deserved a medal. He, he flew us back and by the time we got back the pilot recovered enough to make a landing and we searched for a hospital for me and uh, so I described briefly uh, I thought I was gone and I I it was peaceful I, I thought this is this is what it must be what will the folks think and uh, for some reason or another the good Lord decided I wasn't to go yet so he brought me back. <laughs> Here I am now today, hopefully serving him. Uh, and he's given me a chance to serve him in my latter days. And uh, so I want to want to compliment the, our. Uh, what I wanted to do was compliment our leaders for their foresight in giving you adequate training before they put you in harm's way, and doing the preparation so that we could be most effective in giving you the most uh, intelligent information and the safest way to get to the target and all all based on uh, the fact that uh, you can serve effectively in harm's way due to their leadership and intelligence. I think I better uh, end with this uh, thought that we went to uh, uh, Hanover, Germany, uh, and, and uh, at the target, we had uh, a huge chunk of, of a fragment come through, and uh, it uh, took off the tip of the navigator's thumb. He had been bending over, and he had just came back, come back to look at his maps and uh, it came through on my side, hit the floor, and cut the control column completely off and uh, all of my control cables. So uh, uh, it was my turn to fly and I picked up the yoke and it was <laughs> gone. And uh, the pilot had to fly back. And during that time, this is not a first, but we had to make arrangements and a decision. Do we want to land? Uh, at, a, at a, a longer field or try to make it back to the base. He decided to come back to the base, our, our command pilot. And so we, on our descent, we got the crew to go in the radio room and brace, tail gunner. We, we came down as slowly as we could and asked him to throw a parachute out the tail and we went down to the end of the runway, still making about 50 miles an hour. And uh, I, I cut number one and two engines, the only control we had, unlocked the tail wheel and ran up three and four down into the soft dirt and we made a ground loop so we got back safely. <laughs> and uh, so that's another, another time when uh, that was near the end of our experience where it paid off and uh, so we, we were safe and uh, that, oh, one other thing I better, we were picked as a typical American crew. So we were allowed five days to go to an English air base where we flew in the Lancaster. And where was that? At the Lancaster bomber. But I mean, where, what base? Do you remember? Uh, that would be in 1945, mm -hmm. early 45, where, uh, and, and uh, so we got to spend five days with them, and they spent five days at our base, and that's where we flew together, and uh, and we learned the, the rudiments of how they flew, and they do learn how we flew formation. I better mention this. It's been a controversial thing, but uh, one August it was hot and dry, and uh, we had incendiaries we carried, and the English did, and they they bombed Hamburg night after night and day after day, 
and started a giant fire, firestorm. 100 mile an hour surface winds coming in and rising. It fed upon itself and over 100,000 people lost their lives there. And uh, uh, it was not made public as far as I know. But that, that and Dresden were two fire storms that destroyed those cities. Uh, and uh, I think our people were criticized for that. And uh, I, I have to tell you, we uh, were told, and it's, I think it's true, uh, that 60 million people lost their lives in that conflict. And we, what troubled me was we were instrumental in causing a lot of collateral damage and a lot of innocent people losing their lives. And it troubled me for years. Uh, and, and until in the 2005, I came to the Lord, and uh, I was convinced that those people had not perished forever; that they had they had a chance to repent and, or come to the Lord. So I'm now living a life, not of comfort and ease, but a life of praise because the good Lord's given me a chance to do some things to serve him and his children uh, with the help of Chris and all the other people that I can still serve in my in latter days. So that basically is uh, a kind of a resume, a story of my life. Did I ask you some questions? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, okay, when you arrived in England, what, what was the name of your base that you the name was Defum Green. Uh, that's a good question because it was near Attleboro, which in turn was near Norwich, England, and Norwich, England was on the east side, and for us it was an advantage because it lessened our travel time. We were close to the to the channel and close to the continent, and uh, uh, so. And the, the kind of a side note. When we were climbing, we could see them launch their missiles across the way. And, and they had the, the V-1, the buzz bomb to start, mm -hmm. and they had the V-2 rocket that would hit, and they, you'd hear, you'd hit an explosion, but you never, they exceeded the speed of sound, so you never knew when they were coming. Did, uh, uh, when I've talked to other World War II pilots, you know, like uh, Spitfire pilots, they they said that you know when they flew their planes, the pilot and the plane were one. You know, it was just like putting on a glove. You yeah. know, and and the B P fifty one pilots kind of had the same attitude towards their planes. Exactly. What was the attitude towards your planes? How did it fly? How did our? I did, I can did, say did, how, word yeah. When how, how did it handle? It wanted to fly. Yeah. It was like a mother hen. Mm -hmm. It would pr protect you. You could make mistakes, and a, a good old airplane would take mm -hmm. all kind of damage. Mm -hmm. And it it covered up. It was like a mother hen had spread her giant wings and mm -hmm. protected you. And she was, if I may say, she wanted to fly herself. Mm -hmm. She was a beautiful airplane. We mm -hmm. always had an argument. One day we had a mix up and we flew with 24s and uh, they couldn't get our altitude. They were about 2,000 feet below. And there's always been a big argument between those two. Mm -hmm. And they could fly faster, but we could go higher and we could take more, we thought we could take more punishment. Uh, and, uh, so we had some some pretty, pretty uh, heavy wrecks. Uh, Oh, I, I won't take your time now, but we have pictures of, of airplanes that you wouldn't think could ever fly, and they, they made it back. You flew in a B-24, right? No, B-17. I mean, I mean, did you ever get a chance to fly in a B-24? No, sir, no, I no. never did. But you, uh, I, I but they, they were different and in, a little bit, right? And, and they and, were uh, different. They were, yeah. they were faster. And, uh, but they weren't quite as maneuverable, and, and in our opinion, they couldn't take as much punishment as, mm -hmm. as we could take. When you, um, 
you had a chance to go off base. Mm-hmm. Yes. And what oh, were yes. the what? How did the the British people? Uh, I this is a story uh, that I uh, it may may go on. I don't know, but uh, they uh, general uh, opinion the English girls didn't want anything to do with us. I mean, uh, uh, and I, I I say that because I one one evening I wanted to go to Cambridge, England. And I got on a train, and there was a, uh, it was in a compartment, and there was an English girl opposite me. And I asked her, I said, I'm going to Cambridge, and uh, I wanted to see the university. Would you tell me when we get to Cambridge? She said, yes. And that was the end of our conversation. Near the end, I said, uh, would you? tell me where there's a shelter for uh, people, for visitors, Red Cross shelter. And lo and behold, she uh, she got off the uh, train with me and took me to Red Cross shelter. We shook hands and that was the end. People won't believe me, but that was the first nice English girl that I saw. They, they detested mm-hmm. the, the Yanks. Yeah. <laughs> the, the men were they didn't get it nearly as much pay as we got, and they were, they, they, they but they were cordial. They, they, those uh, British uh, pilots in the Lancaster, uh, the base where we went, they were, they were so cordial. Uh, we had a big, we had a big time there. Incidentally, the King and Queen of England came to our base and uh, reviewed had a review, and that was the king who couldn't talk very well. And uh, so the king and queen came there. And uh, one other thing that I forgot to mention, we had what we call a flak leave, what they call it rest and recuperation now. We spent a week in Glasgow, Scotland, as a, as a re- result of having a, giving us a little leave from the combat duties. Um, what was the name of your plane? It was called War's End. And uh, before you go, I'll show you the okay. remnants of a right. uniform I had. Um, and let's see, uh, a typical B-17 had how many crewmen? It started out with 10. Mm-hmm. Uh, I may give you a few statistics, if I may, if sure. we have yeah. time. started out with 10, and uh, it had an open windows in a fuselage and it, it we didn't have a, a nose turret and we were attacked from the front quite a bit well uh, uh, I'll answer your question uh, by uh, the time we got our new B17G model mm-hmm. it was a, it was a, a, a model that was uh, improved from the F which we flew across it had a chin turret and it had enclosed windows for the gunners. They didn't have to stand in that slipstream. One day we had minus 70 degrees Fahrenheit. Instant frostbite. Uh, a lot of casualties mm-hmm. with frostbite. And uh, <coughs> so we had the nose turret. I'll show you a picture of that. Who nose. operated that? Is that a, a the, the nose turret, uh, the uh, bombardier. Oh, bombardier. Uh, bombardier. Uh-huh. I was wondering about that. Uh-huh. And uh, you see, if you have up in that nose, you have all that giant expanse of vision uh, riding in the nose. I can just imagine how that that might be for for him. Mm-hmm. And uh, we uh, we uh, during the uh, uh, the progress of the war. They uh, had uh, lead bombardiers who did the bomb sight and released, and then in the other uh, uh, airplanes they had what they called toggleers. The instant they saw the bombs drop, they dropped theirs. So they didn't have bombardier in every plane, but uh, our bombardier uh, we had. Uh, 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 
we like fall, we like think of it. I have to mention this. Uh, automatic pilot. And the automatic pilot was uh, attached to the bomb site. And so on the bomb run, the uh, bomber deer guided the airplane through through his bomb site. The pilot and co-pilot had nothing to do with it. It all was controlled by the bomber deer. And uh, so it had about 40 miles there where you were in flak. And, and uh, the fighters didn't always come in in their own flak. It's when you when you had the rally point, and then they followed you on. But uh, I, anyway, the, the bombardier, when he dropped, the toggleers would drop theirs. And they, usually they had, we always prayed for a good, experienced bombardier who could intentionally, this was done intentionally, to, to change your heading slightly to get away from that next burst of flight. Mm -hmm. they, they were tracking in on you. and. Uh, uh, if he was good, he could make a correction. He, he didn't bother his, he was good enough to hit his target, but he could make a, one or two corrections going down the bump run. Mm -hmm. That helped us a lot. And so we, they, they wouldn't be able to track you as easily? That, they, they, yes, we just flew straight and level, and of course they had the, their tracking. They, they, could, they knew where we'd be in the next instant. And uh, mm -hmm. we usually lost uh, one or two can uh, lead planes every mission. We lost 110 altogether. And uh, now this is something I have to add. We bombed through the clouds a lot of times. Uh, and uh, we hoped it was accurate. But in, in uh, visually, they, they say that uh, they could see our contrails up above five miles high. They couldn't see our airplane, but they could. They knew we were up there, and they could track on us. But if we had clouds, we could do a little bit of evasive action and get away from that next burst of flak that was coming. And uh, so uh, that was uh, that was uh, one other item. We we carried. Uh, Here's what uh, I wanted to tell you. We burnt uh, six million gallons of fuel every day, and uh, we burned 300 gallons an hour. And with a full load, that uh, uh, that uh, load of 2,780 gallons didn't last that long. It it uh, our range wasn't great. We could go as far as Berlin and back. But so what was it? How many hours were you in the air typically going there? Sometimes and back? eight or nine hours. Mm -hmm. uh, and all that cold. And that I had cold. Mm -hmm. And uh, the poor little ball, ball turret gunner was down there in his fetal mm -hmm. position, and the tail gunner down on his knees with his feet behind him, riding all that time. Mm -hmm. And and uh, we in the cockpit with the, with our uh, spare. We couldn't fly with our parachute on our chest, so we had to hang it down on the side, and that was heavy. By the time you <laughs> you got back, you could hardly walk uh, mm -hmm. because that parachute hanging on on your lap and uh, so on. So on a on a, a typical mission day, and you flew twenty two missions, correct? Flew twenty two missions. Yeah, yeah. Um, Start us through, okay, you know, like, uh, when were you told you were going to go on a mission? The day before? Oh, that's a good uh, and then good And then question. the whole sequence of the day. After All right, that. thank you. Uh, every evening, at least in the officer's bar, they had a signal behind the bar. Uh, it was a red ball, a green ball, and a white ball. And uh, so if you'd go by there and you'd see what was in store next day. If it was a green ball, you knew you better get to bed early because we were going on a mission. If it was a white ball, it was standby. We were on a standby. You may or may not go according to what they had planned. Uh, and a green ball, I'll go back, is a stand down. 
uh, and a red ball, if you saw a red ball put up, that was a signal that you'd be called on to fly. Am I getting that correct? The red ball was a, was a, was a signal that you were flying next day. Mm -hmm. The white ball was uh, a standby. Mm -hmm. A green ball was a stand down. Okay. If you had the green ball, you knew you went. You weren't going to fly the next day. Okay. All right. So uh, let's say the red ball. You knew you better get to bed early because about 3 a.m. they were going to come and wake you up. And uh, by the time you got uh, dressed and uh, you went to breakfast, and then uh, then you. Uh, after breakfast, then you went to, to uh, a briefing, the, the, a briefing is called, and then you got in the truck and they took you out to your airplane where it took about another hour to do your inspection and loading, and the lo planes would have already been pre-flighted and uh, armed. And, and incidentally, I, I, I remember right, I think we carried around 2,000 rounds of ammunition mm -hmm. and uh, 13 guns uh -huh. right and, and the G's and 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 the bombs would be from two and a half to five tons mm -hmm. of bombs and we carried incendiaries along with it mm -hmm. now I was told this now they may have, other people might disagree but if possible if you fired all your guns simultaneously your ammunition would be gone in two minutes. Uh, so they had to conserve for waiting for attacks, and they couldn't they couldn't fire long bursts either. So so along with the bomb load and the ammunition and uh, we and the fuel, we weighed about thirty tons, mm -hmm. and we had two thousand yard runways. And it took every bit of that to, to get off. So, what was a briefing like at the at the, uh, the in briefing? The morning? It was uh, that's good. The briefing, you you entered in, you, you entered in, and uh, they had three officers there, as I remember the the weather officer, and uh, the intelligence officer, and the, the man who would describe the mission to you. We'd, we'd register, come in, and they'd check you off, and uh, then, then uh, all, all seated, and then they had a map covered by curtains, and they'd draw the curtain, and there you'd see they had the map routed, and intelligence officer would come and tell you what you might see on the way, what di diversions the, uh, the people might offer to draw fighters away from us. They tried to send us through flat corridors where we were out of range of the flat guns, and I, I, I admired those intelligence. We had uh, people that volunteered to fly the night before uh, and uh, alone to check the weather and check everything before us, and they got credit for a mission for doing that. They were volunteers. And I know I'm digressing, but these okay. things come to mind. They had uh, more weary airplanes that couldn't fly, uh, couldn't serviceable anymore. And so we had a, a submarine base at Heligoland over near Sweden. And they'd load that with uh, explosives, TNT, and they'd ask for volunteers to take that airplane up and then jump out and they guided over to the submarine pens and let it explode. Mm -hmm. they, they had to, so those people who did that got credit for a mission also. Uh, I think one of our men died, one of uh, Roosevelt, I well, think. It was uh, Kennedy. Kennedy yeah, died. John too. Kennedy. Uh -huh. Yeah, I think, yeah. Uh -huh. yep. And then, okay. of course, there were other missions. Uh, this goes on. Mm -hmm. they, ha uh, they had a place in Ireland They'd load up a 17, go over and bring back Irish whiskey. <laughs> Bless them. <laughs> Did the pilot get credit for that mission? <laughs> no, no, no credit there. <laughs> but uh, at, at, at debriefing, that there's something we have um, neglected to say. 
they gathered you at debriefing and they kept you for a considerable time uh, and they asked you what you saw, what how your mission went, what you saw, how many planes did you shoot down, what was the weather, and uh, so that took a, a good half hour more of your time and uh, this sidelight the, the uh, Salvation Army was always there with coffee and donuts. Mm -hmm. They never failed, bless them, when they, when they met us after a mission. <laughs> they, they were really true blue people. And, and uh, the uh, intelligence officers were good on debriefing. They wanted to know everything about what you saw, what, how many fighters you saw, and uh, any, uh, how the whether your mission was successful or not, uh, whether they had cameras that took pictures, and the diversion, they uh, had uh, diversionary uh, attacks to draw fighters away from us. To, to, uh, so they had everything, they planned the night before, night, uh, all night long. And we were so, so pleased with how they planned and I was always so pleased with the leadership and how they, how they planned our missions. And uh, uh, we had, uh, we had uh, fighters, some of whom would go in and strafe the black guns before we, are, before we hit the target. Were they uh, P-51s or P-47s? Oh, uh, well, uh, P-51s, uh, they had a, uh, air, uh, liquid cooled engines mm -hmm. and they were susceptible to ground fire so they you remember that old P P47 uh, uh, it had a big heavy radio engine mm -hmm. and they could strafe because it took a lot to bring one of those down for ground fire so the 51s were good at high altitude and the 47s were good for strafing mm -hmm. and the P-38 was yeah. used too. Yeah. Uh, they helped us a lot. They were our angels. They uh, they flew uh, uh, escort for us during the latter part of the war. They'd pick us up uh, at uh, as we crossed the channel and then they'd fly. They could go as far as Berlin with us. The uh, uh, 38s or the or the 51s or the 51s. 51s, yeah. Uh -huh. The P47s. They they couldn't. They were good for strafing, and, and they were good, durable, but they didn't have the maneuverability that the 51s were. They were just beautiful aircraft. They, they were, we called them our angels. <laughs> they, they, were, they were really good. They kept a lot of the fighters away from us. Now, the, the, the German fighters, uh, was there any particular one that you feared more than the others? I mean, there was the uh, uh, the 109 and uh, they, uh, Folkwolf 190. The, they they were in the same category. The the Emmy 109s seemed to be the most dangerous, in our opinion. And then later in the war, they had an M Emmy 262. Mm -hmm. Did you ever uh, see one of those? Yes, they, they went through our formation. Mm -hmm. And the only redeeming factor is, at the time that I was aware, they couldn't stay aloft much more than 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. Their fuel supply gave out on them. But uh, our 51s were much more were maneuverable than that 262. Mm -hmm. They didn't have the speed, but they, they were an all-round aircraft that uh, I think anyone would be delighted to fly in. Uh, they, they were good. And, and our uh, B-17s with the four engines, I was co-pilot, and uh, so I used the yoke in my right hand, and the, the uh, throttles, the four of them, and they connected with a crossbar and they were, you couldn't, you didn't have the strength to push them forward and backward. You had to walk them up and back and forth. And uh, that, took a, that took a lot of stamina to, to, after flying several hours, you know, uh, in formation maneuvering. 
incidentally, we, we flew a low element lead in the low squadron. So we, uh, if you can imagine, we were lead plane and we in formation, but we were an element lead, had a plane on each wing. So we had the luxury, uh, since we were an element lead, that we could, we could uh, change course some slightly, e even in formation, and still stay in formation. And uh, so that, that g gave us uh, that uh, luxury of having a chance to change our heading a little bit. Uh, you might as well call it evasive action. That, that if we were tracking on us, we could we could change course a little bit, and the fellows on our wings were happy. Uh, we had a saying around the base: our pilot would do that when they tracked on us with their guns. They say, "Fly with Harry." <laughs> but uh, it wasn't against the rules or anything because. They always had to stay close for firepower, you know. Mm -hmm. But it being an element lead, you had a little bit of leeway on your on your course, course changing, mm -hmm. and so on. And and the structure of the of the flight, you know, the flight pattern, and everything else was so that everybody's guns could cover everybody else. Right? Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And, and how, how many and layers of planes would there be? How many? Like you had a low squadron and um, yeah, yeah, so yeah. on and so on. And you had, to, you had, let's see, starting out with squadron, you had the lead, three airplanes, mm -hmm. and then then you uh, then you had the high three element, and the low element down here, and that was a squadron, mm -hmm. and that was repeated uh, throughout the group. Mm -hmm. with, with, uh, the squadrons were elevated the same way, mm -hmm. so you had a vertical distance between them. That was amazing. Uh, uh, the 50 to 100 feet difference in altitude, and and uh, so the, the the whole group took up a lot of airspace. Mm -hmm. that, but that was the, that's what they developed. It seemed to be the most proficient in uh, mm -hmm. in. Uh, handling uh, enemy fighters. Uh, I, I think I quoted, our, our group was one that uh, came over in February 44, and that, that's when they, they needed replacements. Uh, I forget how many thousand aircraft we lost. It was we, in our group alone, we lost, uh, we lost 110 in our group alone. Uh, but uh, anyway, we were what what you might call a replacement group. We we got over in the in uh, October '44, and the, uh, the Eighth Air Force had been going since early '43. So they they had uh, they had uh, their their missions were uh, met by enemy fighters mostly. Uh, that's when the Luftwaffe was for was numerous, but they had a lot of airplanes. And when we got there, the Luftwaffe was gradually losing, but uh, their fact guns were uh, improving. Some targets had 600 flat guns. Uh, Merseburg, the oil refinery, had 600 guns around it. And the Germans were good at building their production people in populated areas. They, uh, we had no choice. Uh, we knew there was collateral damage, and we couldn't help it. Uh, we were sent to destroy a manufacturing plant, and 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 and, uh, and uh, our our bombing wasn't that accurate. But it had to be. It had to cover a large area. That troubled me. I I, I say because I knew a lot of lives were being lost. And, the same way the Germans, uh, they thought that they could bomb uh, England into submission, but they made a mistake. They, they concentrated on London, and uh, the, 
the London, uh, the English people moved their facilities out in the hinterlands and they rebuilt their air force. And, and so Hitler made a terrible mistake. So, um, when, when was your last mission? March 15, 1945, and we went to Berlin. Yeah. And, and we didn't hit Berlin Central City, we hit the rail yards in a place called Oranienburg, mm -hmm. and the Russians were advancing, and, and our mission was to help them get into Berlin. So that was our last mission. Mm -hmm. How many planes were involved? That would be a, a normal uh, task force would be around a thousand heavy bombers, plus uh, support, uh, probably 500 support. And that's how many planes were involved. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you why. If you got over a thousand and, and your task force had to make a turn, if, if a, even a thousand was cumbersome, I, I described briefly, you made a turn and the people down on the inside of the turn had to throttle back and almost stall and the fellows up on the top side have to give full throttle to make that turn. So it was cumbersome. They couldn't, 2000 was almost unheard of for, for, being, uh, for, for being cumbersome, you know. They took off morning. There were some were returning from their missions and others waiting to take off that day. Mm -hmm. The miracle that I described We'd been on the stand down for several days. Weather was bad. And that day, Christmas Eve day, miracle, the, the weather cleared and all over Europe, all the Allies raised all their air forces all at once. And they hit Germany all day long. And, and that's when the people at the Battle of the Bulge were released from their surrounding and so, that, that is, if it's not that, that the pride, no, not that. It's the fact that I got to be a part of that, at least be effective in helping release those people um, that were trapped. And they were out of ammunition and food. And I'm supposed to go to Fort Campbell, Kentucky in January the 101st Airborne has invited uh, myself and some others to come and help celebrate that Battle of the Bulge. Neat. So, uh, one couple more quick questions. Uh, okay, uh, what about the ground crew? Did each plane have its own ground crew? Each one, beautiful. And, and well, how many men were, men were involved in that? They're roughly on our base, about 2,000. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, each, each section was assigned an airplane, and they were so faithful. Mm -hmm. And I haven't managed mentioned battle damage so much, but sometimes we'd come back with a hundred holes in the aircraft, and they'd patch them up and change engines if needed, and have that ready to go the next day. They, and they, they were night and day. How, how many guys were assigned to each plane? as far as the ground crew, do you remember? Uh, no, it would be a wild guess, but uh, in looking, I'd say between 15 and 20. Mm -hmm. uh, were, they outnumbered the flying crew mm -hmm. quite a bit. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, they, they uh, religiously, uh, they stayed up all day and all night getting those airplanes repaired and, uh, and uh, uh, patched up and ready to go next day. It was the most amazing thing I ever saw. So in, uh, when did you learn that the war was over? Uh, May the 7th, 1945. Uh, uh, we'd had blackouts all over England and they raised the blackout and uh, uh, when I finished my tour, they kept me on as duty officer until May, and I was answering the telephone and answering uh, some of the missions that were planned and so on. 
And it made, in my mind, May the 7th, 1945, the war was over. That's when the Germany surrendered. And I have to add, at the end, near the end of the war, the Germans were, uh, their Luftwaffe was almost, uh, uh, almost disintegrated, and they had young pilots who had no training, hardly at all, come up, and they tried to ram mm. our aircraft. And they had no experience, very little experience. But I do make this comment. Uh, there's several times. One, the classic one, was when a German pilot guided a damaged aircraft out to the out to the channel, mm -hmm. and they met together later on. You probably heard that story. Mm -hmm. But we had a genuine respect for those German pilots, uh, even though they were our enemy. We knew how intelligent they were. We flew at 35 missions. They flew 400 missions. They didn't have any respite at all. They they flew all the time, and uh, we so we had a genuine respect for them, even though they their mission was to shoot us down. But but we we knew they were well trained and intelligent people. So. And it bears out the fact sometimes, sometimes, in a rare occasion, they'd help us. They'd help us. Um, so, when the war ended, could you talk about like, uh, how, you know, like what happened to you know, like? Did you fly the planes back home? And and when you were, uh, uh, and and talk about going home. That yes, and uh, that's wonderful. I'm glad. And, and then after that, life. if you could talk about your life after that. All right. You know, your career and all, all that, right. so family and so on. Uh, when the war ended, uh, I was sent up to Liverpool, England, and uh, uh, there was a French-owned uh, ocean liner called the Ile de France, and we, I was put on it, and the war it, with Asia, with Japan was still on, so we crossed the Atlantic by ship, and making evasive action all the way across, and got into New York. And uh, then I was given a 30-day leave at home before the war was over with, uh, with Japan. And during that time, this is, I'm glad you asked that, because I got to see how our American public sacrificed extensively. They did without rubber, without tires, without food, rationing. They had rationing and they sacrificed their money and their time and their efforts. Example, uh, Henry Ford, uh, this is a plant up in Detroit, put his uh, plant on a production basis. He built 12 B-24 bombers every day. And the war ended, we had 80,000 airplanes. We had an armada of airplanes and tanks, the most, the most powerful military <coughs> force the world had ever known, and all due to our American public and their production. They, uh, I, uh, my, myself, we were given a 30-day leave. Uh, I'll go ahead, and I was to go to Asia, go out and fly a B-25, I checked out in it. Uh, the war ended with the bomb, of course. But during that time at home, in July and August, I got to see how the people had sacrificed. It was amazing. I didn't realize, well, here we were all embroiled in our own thing, and uh, I got to see how our public had sacrificed. Example, Henry Ford, Studebaker plant up here in Indiana, started making uh, aircraft engines and uh, and the, the people that built plows and, and uh, 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 other uh, equipment started making tanks and bombs and guns and it was amazing. Uh, I think our uh, legislator was so surprised they were overcome by the first production figures they got from the American public. Well, I, uh, I, uh, 
was went went out to California and I checked out in a B twenty five medium bomber, and uh, and, and uh, before the war ended, they came around and said, "You have some some point a lot of points you accumulated." And they said, "We don't need you anymore." That so I got uh, to go home before the war was ended in August, but. Might correct a misnomer. People thought uh, the Air Force flew uh, so many missions and you were done. That wasn't the case. The ones who finished their combat tour came back home, and uh, some of them were assigned as instructors, some barnstormers, some assigned to the other theater. That's where I was assigned. I was to go to the to the Asian theater after. Uh, serving over in Europe. Uh, my two brothers, my, my brother who washed out was an armorer and he went to Asia. He finished his tour and my younger brother, uh, he was a fighter pilot but he, he was younger so he didn't have to go over into combat. And uh, so my, uh, I, uh, did not want to, to, to extend my career in aviation. I, I was offered to take a test and I could get a commercial pilot's license. So I ended up going into industry and being a combustion engineer for 20 some years. And uh, when, uh, when our industry started to fail, I changed over and went into the wire industry and ended my career being a quality control manager for for electrical products company. So that very basically is how my life and uh, started uh, my change that came about. So I've been very fortunate and extremely fortunate now that uh, I can still serve our good Lord, serve our people, uh, and I'm able to get around and still still have a memory left and. gone to several churches and schools and uh, I always uh, 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 urge the students please continue your education and I put myself if if I hadn't had an education I couldn't have served effectively and I say I want you to continue your education because someday the country's going to call on you for service and you can serve them effectively if you have a good education. So that's my message to the youngsters now. And, uh, so uh, that was a, a kind of a brief resume of my after after service life. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Can I interject and can I have you tell everybody how old you are? I'm 92. Mm -hmm. And, and I have a question if it, if you have time it takes about 10 minutes if yeah. you'd like to hear that uh, tape sure uh, yeah okay uh, uh, because the story and I yes I think our our longer deer should have had a medal for that yes. when, when you hear this story. okay well I'll tell the story uh, we uh, carried uh, not only a uh, bomb load, but we carried incendiaries, and uh, at this particular time, the ground crew had decided to act, uh, to uh, uh, employ incendiaries with cable that uh, that event it eventually ended up in making our bombs hang up, and during that time, the, the bombs were armed and the spinners were spinning and they were about to explode uh, at our altitude and our bombardier uh, went back to the bomb bay and handed his uh, riser strap to the radio operator who held him and he, he dangled out of there about 25,000 feet above the earth uh, dislodging those hung up bombs before they exploded. So we didn't have much time to do that. The, the, the little propellers were uh, attached to a timer. Uh-huh, yeah. and the timer would make the bombs think they were 
they were employed to explode about a thousand feet above the ground and they spread all that fire mm -hmm. across that and uh, and they were about to do that in our airplane <laughs> and so this man and the radio operator both went back and the radio operator held him by the riser strap while he went down into Bombay and dislodged those bombs so that was quite a that's quite a story mm -hmm. and, and he's still alive today mm -hmm. bless him. do you remember the names of your crew yes I remember could you uh, I have pictures uh, that I can show uh -huh. you that I could name. We had Harry Simmons, the pilot, and uh, myself, and uh, Hal Crystal, the bombardier, Moose Norton, the navigator, and uh, uh, Ray Bromps, the tail gunner, and uh, 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 let's see, the uh, Lyman Davis was the crew chief, uh, and the, and the, the, the uh, uh, waste gunner was. Uh, uh, I'm trying to think. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, I I mm -hmm. struck a blank there. No, I, I, I I could I have their pictures and names mm -hmm. every place. Well. Uh, I'll I'll turn off the I'll turn off the recorder and then we can find that. Oh, How's that sound? Well, we